Um, you want to control your own side? Yes. All right. I just need a button. Yep. Sounds good. <coughs> Can everybody hear me okay? So, sound good. Okay. The worst thing is to have a talking mouth and not be able to hear what the person's saying. Um, so um, again, I'm Molly Factor Leggett, I'm a clinical psychologist. I'm with the Department of Behavioral Medicine. I'm also adjunct associate professor uh, in the Department of Psychology at WVU. Um, my areas of specialization are trauma um, and the care of transgender and gender diverse kids, adolescents, and adults. Um, today, what, um, what I'd like to present on, or what I've been asked to present on, is the affirmative care for transgender and gender diverse kids. Um, and I'm going to start at a pretty basic level in the hopes that that catches people up, um, but I will provide additional resources for folks um, who feel like they get lost at somewhere in the presentation. Um, Caitlin has the policy statement for the American Academy of Pediatrics on comprehensive care and support for trans transgender and gender diverse kids and adolescents, and she'll send that out. Um, and I've got some links as well, uh, and we're happy to put those in an email in case anybody's interested in those trainings as well. So let's get started. Um, I use she, her, hers pronouns. And um, important first disclosure. Um, one thing that's really relevant and important to know is that all medical treatment for gender dysphoria is considered off-label. And what that means is there is no FDA-approved um, treatment for gender dysphoria or for the ICD-10 code for transgenderism. So what that means is there have been no uh, clinical trials or um, FDA approval processes around hormone blockers or hormones uh, for treatment of gender dysphoria. We will be talking about that because that is the standard of care, um, but there is no financial incentives for drug companies to do these kinds of clinical trials on medications that have long since gone into, um, what is the word? They're, they're not label, they are ge generic. Generic, there you go, brain wasn't pulling that word out. Um, so all those medications that are regularly used for transition-related care are in generic, uh, and so there isn't a particular um, financial incentive for any companies to go through the process of um, using it on label for gender dysphoria. Also stigma, but we'll talk a lot about that. <clears throat> the learning objectives for today is recognizing gender dysphoria when and how to refer a youth for medical treatment, to become familiar with the standards of care for gender dysphoria in children and adolescents, and to have an understanding and be able to describe to others the affirmative care model and how it applies to the treatment of transgender and gender diverse children and adolescents. You'll see throughout my presentation that I'll abbreviate um, transgender and gender diverse with PGD, and that's because that takes up a lot of room on a slide. So um, it is a commonly used abbreviation. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what that means in a moment. So for people who are already lost, uh, there is a nationally recognized training. It is free access for all. It is called the Safe Zone Project. Uh, it is in its fourth or fifth version at this point. Most college campuses ha have um, people who are trained in providing Safe Zone training. Um, here at WVU, the LGBTQ Center um, alternates months between giving a general Safe Zone training and giving a transgender Safe Zone training. Um, those are free and open to the larger community. Um, if you don't have access to one in your immediate community, you can take it online. Um, the Safe Zone training is really uh, a basic foundational training on LGBTQ um, individuals in, in our communities, uh, terminology, um, a, a, some understanding of discrimination and stigma, um, as well as how you can be an ally in your community. So uh, if you've never had that, I encourage you to start there. So within this presentation, um, we're going to use some, some specific terms. So um, the American Academy of Pediatrics uses this term gender expansive. Um, I don't know any kid who identifies as gender expansive, um, but it is a term that's used to talk about um, children who do not conform to cultural expectations around gender. Um, the word transgender is someone who, I, whose gender identity, their internal sense of who they are, does it match the sex they're assigned at birth? 
um, and transgender kids can be referred to as transgender boy. So that's a child who's assigned female at birth and identifies as a boy, a transgender girl, who's a child who is assigned male at birth, identifies as a girl, or non-binary, which is um, children or adults who don't identify as either male or female. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, outside of the scope of this presentation, but a relevant and important area of learning is a discussion around intersex and disorders of sexual development. Um, and, you know, I often think about how um, trans people and the trans community are very much marginalized discriminated against, stigmatized in a pervasive way to the point that it causes an enormous amount of minority stress. I would say that intersex individuals, people who identify as intersex or people who have disorders of sexual development um, have that amplified times 100. They are virtually invisible in our culture despite being um, a significant portion of it. So um, talking about that and the cross section between that and transness and trans identity is beyond our, our capacity in this hour. Um, but if people have <laughs> questions, concerns, or consulting on cases that are related to children who have um, disorders of sexual development and would like to consult with me, I also have connections to experts um, around the country who have that knowledge quite a bit more than I do. So I'm happy to make those links. So <clears throat> the starting point is when you don't know, ask. Um, often we, it doesn't occur to us. We read um, gender before almost anything else. Um, race and gender are those things that immediately get clocked when we meet someone. And, um, and we also know when someone doesn't immediately click for us, where we don't immediately know. And then we go to the like, huh, I wonder how they identify. And then we usually make a conclusion and we move forward from there. Anytime you have a huh moment, um, stop and consider whether it makes sense to ask, and what you wanna ask in a way that is open-ended, open-minded, and portrays a desire to connect and understand. So to that end, um, I believe that allies, people who, such as us, who are in a position to encounter these, these children, these adolescents in therapeutic environments, um, should model uh, pronoun sharing. It gives people an opportunity to know that we're an ally right away. You can't see it here, but I have a button that says my pronouns are on my on my lanyard. I'm wearing the trans flag lanyard. I have a big rainbow necklace. Like I advertise it everywhere I go. And I'm not suggesting everybody needs to, to go to that level. Although I will tell you that everywhere I walk in the hospital, people stop me and talk to me about these things. So uh, it does open up opportunities for conversation. My clients, when they come in to meet me for the first time, immediately know that I am a resource that is willing and able to talk to them about how they identify. So kids understand at a very young age the idea of pronouns. If they don't understand, it's a good opportunity to talk about it. So say, you know, hi, I'm Molly, and I use she, her pronouns. And it's an opportunity for someone who wants to communicate their pronouns to be able to communicate that to you. Um, and if they don't want to, they don't have to. Um, it's sort of an optional, there's no social contract about sharing pronouns and that being a mandatory uh, exchange. So ask people what, they, what pronouns they use, share what pronouns you use. Um, you can ask young people, and it's often a very powerful thing to ask any young person, is there another name that you would like me to use? Um, my name when I, was, when I was born was Margaret on my birth certificate. And I never, ever went by Margaret. My parents called me Molly from the moment I was born. And so anytime I would go to the doctor or to some other kind of appointment, someone would call me Margaret because that was what was on my health record. Um, and it was very incongruent for me. People who called me Margaret didn't know me. So had an adult said to me, is there another name you would like me to use? It would have it would have invited an opportunity for me to share something about myself and an immediate opportunity for connection. So it's not just relevant to transgender and gender diverse kids, it's relevant to all kids that you ask them about themselves and you find ways of connecting. Um, especially with uh, kids who are already presenting as gender expansive or gender diverse, but um, also with all kids and especially teenagers because they love to talk about how they identify, asking kids, you know, how do you identify? Is there, are there any particular terms? And that opens up lots of conversations. They can take it anywhere. It can be about race. It can be about 
interests. It can be about sexual orientation. It can be about gender identity. It's an opportunity to ask kids like what is salient and important to them. So if you don't know, ask. Um, one of the big things that's coming up a lot lately is this question about non-binary. We're hearing teenagers a lot talking about um, identifying as non-binary and wanting to use they them pronouns. People get really caught up on language and semantics. The short of it is that we've used they them to talk about people we didn't know the gender of for hundreds of years in literature. Um, if you're getting hum hung up on it, it's you. you are, you're getting hung up on it. It is a socially appropriate um, use of that pronoun as a singular. Um, so please do it because it's not about you. It's about honoring somebody else's experience. Um, people who identify as non-binary don't identify as male or female. Um, they have a unique set of challenges in society because often it means that they do not um, ever pass as cisgender. So cisgender is not transgender. Right? So it is, it is anyone who identifies with the sex they were assigned at birth, consistent with the sex they were assigned at birth. Um, so for non-binary people, there is the potential to either consistently feel invisible because people always make an assumption based on your appearance and they go with that and they never ask any questions or to be constantly misgendered or misunderstood based on how people are reading you. Um, Non-binary people may or may not want medical interventions. We don't have any large scale studies that are looking at um, what people are seeking in terms of medical care who identify as non-binary. Um, I've been in the queer community for over 20 years and it's really only been in the last five years where there was any visibility around non-binary identities. We used to have other terms like gender queer and other things like that, but um, it has really been recently that there has been famous people who are identifying as non-binary. And so young people are starting to understand that there are, there are options around identity that are not based on the binary of male and female. Uh, in terms of population, today we're really focusing on trans youth. Um, depending on the research study, between 0.3 and 1.5% of the population identify as trans. Young people, the younger they are, the more likely they are to identify as LGBTQ and especially trans. Um, in a particular population um, that's relevant and interesting is that within um, young people who are identified with autism spectrum disorders, um, five to seven percent of them identify as transgender or gender diverse. Um, there's a specific set of standards of care and some different challenges that those young people have uh, in coming out and feeling supported. West Virginia has the highest rate of transgender and gender diverse youth in the country. So 1.04% compared to the national average. That's based on the Williams Institute research study that takes the CDC, um, it's not the national, uh, it's the, I can't see my notes because I'm just seeing the slides, but it is a risk behavior survey from the CDC that's administered to all adolescents in high schools throughout the country. Um, so it's a very large, large scale study and um, we came out on top. So gender nonconformity, gender diversity is not the same as gender dysphoria. So gender nonconformity is the extent in which individuals' um, gender identity, their role, their expression differs from some set of cultural norms. Um, this can be illustrated by like the, the little boy who loves ballet, right? So he loves ballet. Um, people assume that is, you know, well, maybe he's gay. Why would he like ballet? Um, which again, right, so that's a sexual orientation based on um, something that is gendered behavior, but it happens all the time in our culture that those two are um, conflated. But it's where the child enjoys ballet. He loves ballet. He knows that he's a boy doing ballet. Um, and so he doesn't experience discomfort and distress about being a ballerina. Um, the only potential discomfort or distress he experiences is, is when other people are jerks about it and treat him badly because he's a boy who likes ballet. So that's like a gender nonconforming behavior, um, but that child does not necessarily have gender dysphoria. Um, some portion of people who experience gender nonconformity, and typically the more they do not conform to, uh, to our standards of gender, um, have gender dysphoria, and that's discomfort or distress. Um, by the discrepancy between their identities to their internal sense of self and the sex they were assigned at birth. So you'll see I drew a little graph for you. So it's, it's like a portion of people who are gender nonconforming also experience that, that internal discomfort. And when we talk about dysphoria, we're talking both about that internal sense. So um, this body does not fit how I feel in my mind. 
like who I know I am. And also this kind of discomfort, you all in the world do not see me the way that I see myself, the way that I feel. I'm not gonna go into the diagnoses too deeply because I wanna make sure we have enough time for questions, um, but I wanna highlight uh, an important piece. And these are readily available in your DSMs, which hopefully you all are very familiar with. Um, and that is that in adolescents and adults, gender dysphoria, um, involves that difference between one's experience of themselves and what they, the assigned sex, it says assigned gender, but the assigned sex they were assigned at birth on their birth certificate, and that they show significant distress or problem functioning as a result of that. Um, it lasts at least six months and it's showed by two of the following things. So I want to note here, I want to sort of put a pin in this idea. So gender dysphoria is the mental health diagnosis related to distress and distress that often causes depression and anxiety, right? So it talks about the etiology of that distress, but it is about <coughs> emotional distress. Um, not all transgender people feel gender dysphoria all the time or at all. Um, being transgender is not, um, is not a disorder. Uh, we have moved away from that language. It's pathologizing, it's stigmatizing, it's not useful. Um, the dysphoria is the term that people have sort of glommed around in the most recent version of the DSM because it describes the mental health component that um, is, is where we provide intervention. So I really wanna note that because there is a long history in the LGBT community of our identities being pathologized and treated and medicalized in a way that is not only not helpful, but harmful. Um, and it, it can be very distressing for trans people to engage in systems um, of healthcare. There is continues to be high levels of discrimination in healthcare against transgender people, and um, they have a lot of reluctance and resistance to seeking care because of the fear of being um, stigmatized in this way, being told they are disordered uh, in their experience. So, um, one thing I want to highlight is notice that it says two for adults and adolescents, and then here's the, the child diagnosis, and this one says six. So same kinds of criteria, but then it also says six of the following, and it's associated with significant distress or impairment of functioning. So the same six months distress, incongruence, but six of the following must be met. So what's the reason behind it? Why, why are we so much more cautious with children? Um, and really it has to do with the knowledge that the appropriate treatment for children is to do whatever is um, requested, necessary, or possible to reduce that child's dysphoria as they go through puberty. So, and that is typically for most transgender children who persist into adolescence, it is, um, it is a medical intervention. So with the overwhelming abundance of caution, we wanna make sure that any child that is going into a significant medical intervention such as hormone blockers and cross-sex hormones has been properly evaluated and meets these criteria and that we're not um, risking medicating children who um, are not experiencing significant and persistent distress. <clears throat> so one really good resource that I'd like to highlight is the World Professional Association of Transgender Health uh, is it used to be called the Harry Benjamin Society. It's been around since the 1970s. They have developed standards of care for um, the treatment of uh, transgender and gender diverse patients. This is the most re recent version, version seven. We're currently working on version eight. Um, I think we have two more meetings before that will be finalized. Um, it is based on the best available science and expert consensus. Um, at this point, we are getting more research on um, trans identities and trans experiences, um, but 10 years ago, there was no research um, that was notable. And interestingly, I think we talk about and think about LGBTQ history as not being very long. You know, some people will mark Stonewall as the beginning of us talking about these things. Um, people have been receiving um, hormone therapy and have been having gender confirming surgeries for over a hundred years in this country. This is not a new thing. It's just a, it's just a new to being talked about thing. Um, so these standards of care are based 
originally out of groups of people who were successfully and often underground doing a lot of this work. It is now a widely supported document by many medical associations. One piece uh, that I think is relevant is there is an entire section on um, supporting transgender and gender diverse kids. So the standards of care say in terms of how to treat gender diverse and transgender kids is that you need mental health professionals who are competent in diagnosing gender dysphoria, so familiar with and able to do differential diagnosis, that they do an assessment of gender dysphoria. There are specific guidelines um, within the standards of care about what components to assess. It's not about uh, policing or providing hoops that people need to jump through to um, perform a gender identity that would get support, but more about really understanding how this is developed in this individual, um, whether they are persistent, insistent, and consistent, which are the three uh, criteria that are usually used to talk about um, young people who will likely go on to identify as transgender adults. The more persistent, insistent, and consistent they are, the higher the likelihood that they will, at puberty, um, continue to, to need supportive care. We always provide family counseling and support. We do an assessment and treatment of coexisting conditions. Um, we refer adolescents prior to puberty or as soon as possible, once they are referred to us for medical interventions to relieve dysphoria. We'll talk a bit about that. Um, and we educate, we need to educate and advocate on behalf of gender dysphoric children here in West Virginia. Um, we do not have any protections for transgender and gender diverse kids in our schools. They are either using the nurse's office or not going to the bathroom at school. Um, they do not have protections within the school. There's no mandate that anybody call them by their affirmed name. Um, you know, there are cases where transgender kids in our school districts have been harassed by faculty and staff, uh, and there is no protection for them. So um, one of our roles as providers in the community is um, to make sure that we are available to educate and advocate on behalf of these children because they are a particularly vulnerable crew. Um, we want to provide information on peer and family support groups. We're making a comprehensive list for um, West Virginia, but right now there are not a ton of resources and we're building capacity in that respect. Um, support for medical affirmation of transgender and gen gender diverse youth at puberty has been supported by the American Academy of Pediatrics. And again, we'll send you article on that, the Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine, the American Psychological Association, American Psychiatric Association, American College of Osteopathic Pediatricians, the Endocrine Society. I, um, of all of the major uh, groups that have any reason to have an opinion about this, they are all firmly in the boat of, um, it is in young people's best interest to seek and receive medical affirmation at puberty. So not to wait. Um, this is a graph I like to show people. Uh, this is from the 2015 um, National Transgender Survey. And this is for um, trans adults looking back at when they first um, really identified that their gender identity was different from their birth certificate. What I find interesting about this is that we know that young people typically have a firm uh, sense of their gender identity by about four. And so I would say the confounding variable here. So about 32% of trans people were like, yep, I knew, well, by four. Uh, and the remaining young people, it is largely uh, that they did not have enough reference points to understand why and how they, you know, why they felt different and what that meant. Um, and so for some of those young people, for some of those people, it was when they went to school and suddenly saw that they did not fit in with their peers because they had different experiences. Um, for another 21%, that's the puberty group, right? So their bodies start changing. So before puberty, um, little boy bodies and little girl bodies, with the exception of their genitals, are very much um, uh, interchangeable. They appear very similarly. Um, and not all trans people have dysphoria around, specifically around their genitals. So that's a relevant piece to that too, which is that when they started developing breasts or started um, having a lower voice or um, developing facial hair, that, that triggered that incongruence for them. And then the, the group that group up at the top, the 16 to adulthood, um, are really people who felt so constrained and sheltered by their family experiences that 
um, it wasn't even something they could consider until they left their family of origins home. Um, I would say it's been another five years since this survey. If we're looking at a younger cohort of young people, we would see more in the younger categories. I'm getting younger and younger kids being referred for, for therapy. Why? Why are some kids trans? Um, Diane Aronsaft, who is um, with San Francisco, um, UC San Francisco, is an expert on um, trans children. And she cites the same resources or the same knowledge that we have around sexual orientation, which is that you know, it is not a unitary thing. It is a combination of nature, nurture, and culture. Uh, and that social experiences may help to shape a child's gender identity, but nothing that we can do as professionals or that families can do caused it, nor is there anything we can do to change it. Um, that trying to do so is extremely harmful. We have decades of evidence on reparative therapy being extremely harmful to LGB and T youth. Um, this is often a, a point of relief for families. I think I, I have many families that I'm thinking of right now in my caseload who the parents are coming in and saying, why, why, why? I need to understand this from a science perspective. Like, what is this about? Um, and it's hard because parents want a reason and we don't have a reason. What we want them to focus on is that what we know that they can, what we know that they can do to best ensure that their child grows up to be happy, healthy, safe. Um, <clears throat> family should seek consultation with a gender expert. So this is the when to get a referral. Um, when their distress is severe, when the distress lasts a long period of time, when they have discussed about a body part that is related, that is gendered, right? Especially their genitals. Um, I have seen many kids who have self-injured specifically just the parts of their body that they're dealing <laughs> with. Um, that is a, certainly a reason to seek support. Um, if distress worsens when the child gets older, especially when puberty begins, we don't do any medical interventions until Tanner stage two. So that's after that first, that first pubertal leap. Um, and we do that for a number of reasons. The medications um, should not be used for a long period of time, the puberty blockers, because of risks of osteopenia and um, bone density. But um, so we don't want to start them before they're necessary. And um, we want to make sure that kids have an opportunity to experience the hormonal changes of their natal sex so that they can be really firm about the, the decision that they make. We don't want significant changes to occur to their bodies, um, so significant breast development, tracheal cartilage, and other things, because those are things that require surgical or are irreversible and contribute to dysphoria. But we do want to give them a little, a little taste so that they can um, be very informed about the decisions that they make. Um, so that's when we we're thinking about puberty as a really critical point of intervention for these young people. If a child um, insistently, consistently, persistently asserts um, their gender identity, um, or if a child requests meeting with someone, you know, who knows stuff about that gender stuff, that's often how they get to my door. Um, in terms of treatment for gender dysphoria, supportive counseling if they're under if they're under 11, um, we're typically looking at just supportive counseling. Um, if they have not reached Tanner stage two. Um, gender transition uh, is the thing that is most likely to relieve dysphoria. And gender transition, there are medical and non-medical versions of transition. Um, I put it in red because it's really notable and important. Not all transgender people want medical treatment. That is more consistent with adults, adolescents and adults. Um, most young kids who have significant gender dysphoria um, don't want to mature uh, consistent with their um, sex assigned at birth. We always want, whenever possible, to provide family therapy, parent support, couples therapy if parents are in conflict about interventions, peer support groups for kids. Um, and here at WVU, we're really conscious about um, doing things as a treatment team, that we are working together to address the um, potential other compounding variables that make it difficult for young people and their families to get support. Some of that is navigating insurance coverage and um, figuring out how to communicate with the school and looking at um, legal options for name changes and things like that that help to ensure safety and wellness of kids in our community. Um, and there's still a lot of things that parents are having to do in order to just ensure that their school-aged child is safe going to school in the community. So. 
having care coordination, having mental health involved to help navigate that, having a supportive and thoughtful primary care provider is pretty critical. Common steps in gender transition, social transition. So that's changing your hair, your clothes, your name, your pronouns, what restrooms you use. Um, it is appearing uh, as, a, as the gender you identify with. Puberty blockers are GnRH analogs, such as lupronide, lupron injections, or histrolin acetate, which is a, an implant. Um, those are relatively safe medications. We've been using them for a long time for precocious puberty, um, and they are used for one to two years in early puberty. <laughs> it's, a, it's a pause button. We'll talk more about that. Hormone therapy, such as um, testosterone or estrogen. Surgical interventions, such as top surgery, which is breast uh, enhancement or um, chest reconstruction for trans masculine people, bottom surgeries, genital surgeries, and facial feminization surgeries, and then legal transition, which is very variable depending on the state you live in. So um, there's a lot of barriers in this country right now to people having legal gender affirmation. So in terms of getting your gender and your name recorded on your, correctly on your birth certificate, um, school records, um, passport, driver's license. Um, and there is a, a, a huge push within communities of parents of trans kids to take care of legal things before their kids reach the age of majority, because once they do, there are even um, stricter and more additional barriers that people have to jump through. So there's a lot of challenges around um, people legally being able to um, Transition. Social transition, um, clothes, hairstyle, choosing a name, choosing, um, indicating what pronoun they want to use. Um, we, keep, we keep coming back to this bathroom thing, and I wish, I wish it wasn't about bathrooms. I mean, it wasn't about water fountains, um, you know, five decades ago. It's, it's, not about, it's not about bathrooms, but people are really concerned about bathrooms. It's about predators in bathrooms, but it's not about transgender kids in bathrooms. But um, it is a major cause of anxiety for many, many transgender kids. Um, it is a barrier that lots of systems have created to people just living their normal life. And about 8% of adult trans people have kidney, um, chronic kidney issues as a result of holding it all day long because there's no safe place for them to go to the bathroom. 8%. Like that's much higher than the average population. Puberty blockers. So this is the Lupron and histrolin acetate. It delays um, so the development of secondary sex characteristics. It's really a pause button. So even if parents are really unsure of what to do next or a child is still figuring this out um, and often they are in a panic because they're starting to go through puberty and things and dysphoria has just skyrocketed and um, puberty blockers let, lets everybody take a deep breath and figure out what's next. It's completely reversible. As soon as you stop taking puberty blockers, you go through your natal puberty. Um, it has very limited side effects. Um, the, the primary thing that's important to know is that it doesn't stop um, like growth in terms of height um, <clears throat> or cognitive development. So uh, if you have like a trans, um, a transgender girl who is assigned male at birth, um, and she comes from a, a family of six foot four males. Um, that it's not going to stop her from being six foot four. The blockers themselves will not stop. You have to add estrogen to um, seal off the ends of the growth plates. Um, so it's not something you can use for four, five, six years while you figure things out. It's a one to two year intensive um, time for intervention. It allows youth also to have a couple more years to really have an understanding about what's next for them and the choices that they make moving forward. We really like to, to have families be very informed in this consent process. The medical intervention for transition is not the hard part. Um, we've been doing it for many, many years. We know how to do it. Um, it has limited side effects, limit, limited medical risks. Um, the greatest risk to this population is around um, living in this world as a transgender person. Um, and there's a whole other discussion we can have around passing and passing privilege. So um, it's a controversial discussion, but it largely young people who pass, meaning they do puberty blockers and then they do cross-sex hormones, 
um, which means that they could walk into a room and no one would ever know that they were trans and that that was part of their experience, have um, normal levels of um, uh, problems with peers and issues around um, peer relationships, whereas kids who don't pass have really, really high levels of bullying, uh, stigma, stigma um, violence against them, as well as discrimination and the like regular microaggressions of people misgendering and misnaming them. So for kids, passing is a goal. We do want kids in every way possible to be able to assimilate within to our, our already very gender binary culture so that they can be safe um, and, and healthy in their lives. Um, so there's this argument, it goes back many years about this watchful waiting, like let's just wait until they're adults and they can make this decision. Let's let them get through puberty. You know that whole thing about brain develop. We're not sure they're ready um, to make such a, they, they can't really understand such a difficult decision. You know, they could risk their, their fertility, although there's recent research that says that that's not the risk that we used to think it was. Um, but the problem is, is imagine living your entire adolescence um, being called the wrong name and being gendered in the wrong way for years. So delaying transition means that instead of helping a young person go through the puberty that feels connected to who they are, and puberty is awkward and awful for everyone, um, it is 10 times worse for kids who feel that it does not fit their body. Um, so imagine at 11 and 12, we're saying you have to wait another eight years before you get to, or six to eight years before you get to live your life. Um, it is an incredibly, incredibly demoralizing experience to be told you have to wait until you're old enough to make that decision. Um, and these kids who are put in a position of prolonging have very high levels of depression, anxiety, suicidality. Um, it feels very hopeless to know that you have to wait. And we, what we do know about the adolescent brain is they're not thinking six years ahead. They're not thinking I'll be okay in six years, which is questionable. They're thinking like, I feel like this is the worst thing ever. I'm living in this life that isn't mine. So the affirmative care model for gender dysphoria is working with kids to help them explore their identity and affirm it. Um, you know, I tell every family that comes in, I don't have an agenda about whether or not your kid ultimately identifies as trans or not. Um, I'm here for this journey and to explore what this feels like and means for you. Um, and we will follow you, your child wherever they go and figure it out. Um, our, our real focus is on the reduction of distress. Um, the reduction of dysphoria is highly correlated with medical interventions. Um, CBT alone does not eliminate <laughs> dysphoria, um, but we also want to strengthen the kids' resilience because being a marginalized person in our country, in our world, um, does increase the risks of depression and anxiety. Um, we want to facilitate adjustment. We want to present both non-medical and medical strategies um, and help them to make fully informed decisions regarding their choices. Um, and that's both with the young people and their parents. Um, none of this will move forward if there's not a parent who is on board with supporting and affirming this child. And lots of parents come into my office and say, I support my child and I love them and I'm calling them by this new name, but they will not, I'm not gonna support medical interventions. And when they hear the research and they understand the risk benefits, um, they're often able to shift to a more um, balanced perspective on what is necessary to give their child the best happiest life. And often that reaction is coming out of fear. You know, as parents, we don't want to do something that's irreversible or could, could really harm our child, or we don't know if it's a phase. Um, and we, we work through those issues with families. You know, this is about um, following your child's lead and figuring it out as we go along and doing the least, you know, doing no harm, like doing the, the least number of things that could potentially set them up for future harm. Um, so in terms of transgender adults, um, we're often hearing in the media, and I hate, you know, as a, a person who sees a lot of transgender kids, I really hate this narrative, but um, we talk a lot about suicide um, because there is an enormous suicide burden in this community. And I don't want young trans kids to think that that's the only reason we're supporting them because like, we don't want you to kill yourself. Um, it's a good reason to support them. But I want them to understand and know that they are valued, 
um, as individuals that they have something special and unique to contribute to our experience, that they are teaching us all something about boxes not fitting everybody. But in terms of adults, very, very high rates of depression, anxiety, um, suicide attempts, 41% of adults have attempted suicide, um, persistent passive suicidal ideation. I would say of the adults I see here in West Virginia, all of them have persistent passive suicidal ideation. Um, it is hard living in West Virginia as a transgender adult, especially if you do not pass, which means you are consistently on a daily basis experiencing misgendering, misnaming, overt and covert aggression um, all the time. So it is not, uh, it is not, it is very much the I can't live in this world um, kind of suicidal ideation. We have high rates of PTSD, substance use disorders, eating disorders, although they're quite a bit different in etiology than the eating disorders of typical teenagers. Um, there's some good research in, on that. And then I think the thing I want to highlight most in this is um, when we treat young people with blockers and hormones, so when young people persist and cyst, consist to puberty and the decision then is to intervene, when we treat them with blockers and hormones, their mental health outcomes. So that 41% suicide attempt, they are consistent with their cisgender peers. It drops to less than 5%. When we affirm kids, when we follow their lead, when they are that distressed and we listen and we take care of them and we prevent them from having to have major surgeries in the future and we um, prevent them from having to go through years of living in this wrong body, in this wrong life, um, they do okay. Uh, and I think that's the most compelling argument for why we would support young people is that um, we want them to just have normal adolescents and adulthoods where they are dealing with the same kinds of psychological distresses that everybody is. Um, this is another resource. This is what I give to parents, which is why I put it up here. Um, you can get this on the HRC, um, the Human Rights Campaign website. You can also get it on the American Academy of Pediatrics website. This is the resource that was developed um, um, with them and the College of Osteopathic <laughs> um, It's a packet for parents. Um, I can give you a copy of it too so you can send it out to the group. It really starts with the basics of um, what is this that you're seeing in your child? Should you be concerned? Um, what kind of support do they need? Do you need how to navigate um, social transition, talking to schools, when to get medical care and support? Um, and why we would do all that for these young people. So. Questions? I, did I leave enough time? You did. Oh, God. Yeah. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. And everybody, we have plenty of time for questions. And if you could, you're welcome to unmute yourself, but you're also welcome to chat it in. No questions. <laughs> it takes everybody a second. Typing, typing. I have a question, Molly. Do you have any resources for siblings, like books or resources of explaining to siblings? And Many. Can you send Caitlin over? Yes. Um, I will also tell everybody a resource that I think people should know about. So here in Morantown, um, we have a PFLAG chapter, and PFLAG is um, it's an organization that's been around, around a long time ago. It, it used to be parents of friends of lesbians and gays. That's how old it is. We still called it that. Um, now it's just called PFLAG. They don't want to be called that anymore because it's not an accurate name anymore. It is a support, a national support organization that pro provides support to families who have LGBTQ kids. Um, in Morgantown, it was largely started to support parents of transgender and gender diverse kids as well as community members. And they redid their charter about a year ago and they have a website and on it, it has a resource link. So it's pflagmorgantown.org and there's a resource link and um, it is an enormous treasure trove of resources, including um, books by age for, um, that would be helpful yeah. in talking to siblings. Um, there's all kinds of materials for families. There's stuff that's more related to sexual orientation, but there's a lot of stuff on there. 
um, for transgender individuals. There's links to like how to change your name legally in West Virginia and all, all kinds of stuff on there. So um, it's sort of in a seemingly obscure um, resource, but they have done a tremendous job in compiling it all in one place and making it immediately accessible to people. Awesome. So I like to sing their praises. I know everybody's still processing, but you're welcome to email us if you have any questions and follow up or anything. I'll make sure Molly gets those. Anybody else here? Yeah. What are some of the best coping things you tell when tell transgender youth when their parents aren't on board? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so one of the hardest things for young people is when they come out to their parents um, as being trans and they don't get the response they're hoping for. Um, and I would say in the vast majority of cases, that's the first step. And the, the instinct when you share something very deep about yourself that you processed or thought about for some period of time is to um, then retreat. You know, the rejection causes retreat. Um, and the thing I often talk to young people about is staying open to those conversations, however painful they might be, that at times um, it's necessary to have those conversations to move forward uh, as a family and that most parents that I meet, the needle moves at least a little bit, if not a lot. Um, that when you're able to have open conversations and if they need to be facilitated, facilitated conversations with a therapist, um, that parents often have reasons why they have a strong reaction, fear, um, concern, um, their own baggage that they're bringing into it, and that um, being open to having those conversations and continuing to talk through it is really critical um, and hard to do. All right. Well, we super appreciate you being here. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. And I know we're going to have follow up questions and stuff. So I hope you don't mind me bothering you later. Not at all. <laughs> all right, guys.